And let me just tell you, he's able to serve and do what he does because of our commitment to pray and to support that work. I hope this week you will use that prayer guide and be praying for our missionary. Get to know some of them. Get to know their stories. Those are men and women that we need to regularly lift up to the Lord. Let's pray for Larry and his wife before we dismiss our kids. Father, again, I come and I thank you for this day that you've blessed us with. This opportunity for us to gather and to worship. And, and Father, I just have to say forgive us when we just take it for granted that it is so easy for us to have access to the gospel to have access to your word and to study it and, and to learn of you and your love for us. But, Lord, there are so many in this world who've never even heard of Jesus. There are so many in this world who've, who've never had that opportunity to hear of your love for them in a very personal and a very real way. God, I pray even this day that, God, you would bless Larry Pepper and his wife the ministry you've given them in Tanzania, the opportunities that you are opening for them through their medical work to make known your love and your grace. Father, thank you for this church planted in a very little remote village. We pray the gospel would spread from that location to many others. And God, today we pray you would guide us and other Southern Baptist churches across this nation as we would pray together and, Lord, as we would give. We pray and we ask that all as we commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, let me dismiss our younger kids to Children's Church. And let's all stand. It's time to praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. And let's do so.
said amen thank you You may be seated in the harvest field now ripen there's a work for all to do hark the voice of God is calling to the work he's calling Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you go in Jesus name if the place you're called to labor seems so small and little known it is great if God is in it He'll not forsake his own. Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you go in Jesus name there's a crown and you can win it if you go in Our men will come. We're going to have our prayer time, and we ask you to join in this special prayer time.
Well, even as we begin this week of prayer for international missions this morning, I want you to look with me at a passage that is referred to as the Great Commission. The Great Commission. Far too often, it's become the Great Omission. But it's the Great Commission. It's God's call on His church then and now, found in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 and 20. As we get ready to consider that passage, let me just share with you some parallel verses that go along with that. The first of those I thought of was John chapter 20, verse 21, where Jesus was talking to his followers, and he says, As the Father has sent me, talking about coming into this world, so I send you. I think of how Luke puts it in Luke chapter 24, verse 47, that repentance for the forgiveness of sins be proclaimed to all nations, beginning here in Jerusalem. Mark chapter 16, verse 15, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to all of creation. And then I think of Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where Jesus says, And after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the very end of the world. But right here in Matthew's gospel, we find Jesus' words to his church, to his disciples, immediately following the resurrection. And I want us to hear him afresh this morning. I pray we will. Would you stand with me in honor of God and his word? And I'm going to begin our reading in verse 16, where it says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came, and he said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And then verse 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Let's pray together. Father God, even as we would consider your word this morning, I pray our hearts would be open to its truth and that, God, I pray there would be a fresh wave of commitment, not just within this church, but within your churches across this land, a fresh commitment to the mission you have called us to, the mission of making known the gospel of Jesus Christ to the ends of this earth. God, we ask for your spirit to teach us, to guide us, to lead us into truth, to speak to our heart. And then, Lord, not just that we would hear, but that, God, we would respond in obedience to what you want in our lives even this day. We come to commit it all to you now, praying that you would receive all glory and honor as we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. This morning, I, I want to just kind of go through some basic, if you would, great commission questions. And, uh, and I can just tell you, if you're familiar with the great commission, it may not be anything you haven't heard before, but I pray it would be something God would speak to your heart in a fresh way, even today. Now, when I say Great Commission questions, it's because in reading through this passage, it raises some questions. And the first of those is, who is Jesus talking to? It begins there where it says in verse 16, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee. Was he just talking to those specific disciples and saying, I want you to go into all the world and preach the gospel to all nations. Can I just suggest to you 
There's no way back in that day and time those 11 men could have ever accomplished that. That wasn't just a word limited to those early followers of Jesus Christ. That's a word for you and I today. Many would suggest that when it says that the 11 went to Galilee, if you back up to what it says where where the, the women came and witnessed Jesus' empty tomb, back up in Matthew 28 to verse 16. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid, but go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see them, see me. They were being obedient to what he had told them to do. Most commentaries would agree that if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 1, or verse 6, I think is where it's at, 1 Corinthians 15, 6, it talks about that after his resurrection, Jesus appeared to more than 500 followers, believers in Galilee. Realize Jesus carried on much of his earthly ministry in Galilee, in the area around the Sea of Galilee. And there would have been many in that area who had believed him and trusted him. And when they got word that Jesus had risen and he had invited the disciples to come, they had all come together to hear what he had to say to those followers. And he gives them this, what we know of as the Great Commission. They were disciples. And the word disciple means follower. They were people who were seeking to follow Jesus. And I can tell you, as you and I seek to follow Jesus today, this is a word for us today. Even as we begin this week of prayer for international missions, sometimes we have the attitude that says, well, we pay the missionaries so that they can go over there and they can go preach the gospel and they can go win the lost. And once we've done that, we've done our part. Or we have that attitude that that's why we pay the preacher, right? The preacher's supposed to go around and he's supposed to go tell everybody about Jesus and help people come to faith and trust in Jesus. And what is our job as a church as a whole? For many people, they think our job is to be the cheerleader. And we just kind of pat them. Weren't y'all proud to have Keith and Tracy Richards here last Sunday to come and cheer? What a blessing. And you can tell God is continuing to use them. And I appreciate the fact that you as a church want to encourage them and, and, and do everything we can. We want to go, absolutely, we're proud of you. Keep going. And I appreciate it when people every now and then pat me on the back and say, Preacher, good job, or, you know, hey, go, go for it. But I can just tell you, it's not just my job, it's not just a missionary's job, it's all of our jobs. The church is not just supposed to be a bunch of cheerleaders that get together and say, go for it. Like people sitting up in the stands watching a football game, and I'm not talking about the Razorbacks, but we won't go there. You know, it's, it's a matter of, you know, saying, hey, you know, we want to encourage you. Or, you know, we want to support you. We want to help you. Let me just tell you, when it comes to the Great Commission, it's important that all of us get in the game. God didn't call us to be cheerleaders, and I can just tell you, he didn't call us to be spectators. And sometimes that's what people think. They're called to do. As long as I can just sit on the pew on Sunday morning, I'm doing what God's called me to do. Let me just tell you, God has called you to go. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, he's called you to go and to carry the gospel. And he may not have called you to go like Keith and Tracy to Thailand or, or like uh, Mr. Pepper this morning in the video to go to Tanzania. But I can just tell you, he's called you to go, and that may mean that you go across the street. It may mean that you go to your neighborhood, to those people that are around you. And, and it's interesting that that word go is actually not in the Greek, the word go. It's a participle. And the idea is as you are going, make disciples. 
I can just tell you, we're all going somewhere, aren't we? Constantly, we're on the move. Let me tell you, he's saying, as you're going, make disciples. Remember what Jesus said to Peter and Andrew when he came upon them as they were mending their nets and they were on the shore after fishing, and he said, come and follow me, and I will do what? I'll make you fishers of men. And I'm not the first one to say it. You've heard it from many other preachers. If you and I are not fishing, we're not following. Because if we're following him, we're going to be doing what we can to help other people come to know Jesus Christ. It was interesting this week, I read about how in 1929, the Soviet Union came up with a plan to completely wipe out the Christian church. Do you know what their plan was? And they had it written up. Their plan was, we're going to let them continue to meet. We're going to let them continue to worship. We're going to let them continue to study their Bible. There was only one thing that was outlawed. They couldn't share their faith. As long as you just keep it to yourself, guess what's going to happen? The church is going to end up folding its doors, and we win. Let me tell you, the sad thing is that today, today, what the Soviet Union was trying to do by declaration, the church today has done by default. And we've quit being serious about sharing our faith and letting other people know who Jesus Christ is. Notice what Jesus is expecting us to do. He's not expecting us to make Christians. Do you notice that? He says, go ye therefore into all the world and make disciples. He doesn't say make Christians. Can I just tell you, none of us can make a Christian. As your pastor, I can't save anybody. You can't save anybody. You know what? Jesus is the only one that saves. I can just tell you the Bible would be clear. This church doesn't save anybody. Jesus is the only one that saves. I think of how it says in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Notice this, in Jesus Christ our Lord. It's in Jesus that people come to know what it is to be made right with God. And as it says in John chapter 6, verse 44, no one can come to him except that the Father would draw them. Can I also point out to you, it doesn't say, go ye therefore into all the world and make church members. I can just tell you, that's sometimes what we think about. As long as we're growing in church members, we're growing, Right? wrong let me tell you we're not called to grow in church members we're called to grow disciples followers of jesus christ can i just tell you and you've heard me say this before we have over 500 names on our church roll we don't need more names on a church roll we need people committed to following jesus christ I know I sound redundant when I say some of this, but it's so important. That's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, and I will build my church. It's not my responsibility as your pastor to build the church. It's my responsibility. It's your responsibility to be obedient, to go. And what's he telling us to do? To make disciples make disciples followers of Jesus Christ I think of how the Apostle Paul expressed it in first first Corinthians chapter 11 verse 1 
He told the believers in Corinth, you follow me as I follow Christ. And I tell you, our calling is to help others follow Jesus Christ. How do you and I go about making disciples? The very first thing I would say to you, we need to be sure that we're following Jesus. I can't lead others to do what I'm not doing. Can I just tell you, and I appreciate we have children and youth that are here that don't have parents here, and I'm not being critical of those who aren't here, but I'm just going to tell you, I'm amazed how many times I visit with parents who want to see their children doing right and following God. That's why I send them to church, so they can learn how to do that. I can tell you, what are they learning at home? What are your kids, what are your grandkids learning from you about what it means to follow Jesus Christ? If I'm going to make disciples, I need to be sure that we are following individually what Jesus wants in our life. And he says, go and make disciples. And then he gets that phrase that we get to a lot of times when we're baptizing. He says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you, baptism is not what saves anybody. But baptism is what identifies those who've trusted Jesus Christ with him as their Lord and Savior. As you hear me say it every time we baptize almost, when someone is baptized, they're acting out what Jesus did. He died, he was buried, and he rose. But we're also acting out the commitment that we have made individually to trust Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. As it says in Romans chapter 6, buried with him in baptism, but risen to walk in newness of life. I've made a commitment that Jesus Christ is going to be the Lord. I'm going to let Jesus be in charge and in control of my life. Let me tell you, the pattern was set back in, Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. You remember what happened? Peter got up and preached and called people to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. And it says those who received his word were baptized. And how many people were added to the church that day? 3,000. Pretty amazing. And let me just tell you, it went over for there. A couple of chapters later, it's talking about 5,000. I think of how when... Paul was converted. When Ananias went and prayed for him, it says something like scales fell from his eyes, and he immediately went and was baptized. In Acts chapter 16, you have the story of the Philippian jailer, who in Paul and Silas, beaten and in prison and in chains, began to sing and praise God, the chains fell off. And the Philippian jailer was ready to commit suicide. He said, don't do that. We're here. You remember the story. And he asked him, what must I do to be saved? And he told him to believe in Jesus Christ. And it was after he believed in Jesus Christ, he came and asked to be baptized, he and his family. The same thing happened when Paul got to, to Corinth in Acts chapter 18. And it says, the leader of the synagogue along with many others, came to believe in Jesus Christ. And when he received the word, it says, and he was baptized. The pattern is when people get saved, they identify with Jesus Christ. And then it says, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the triune God. And then it was, what does it say? Teaching them to observe how many things? All things. All things. Can I just tell you, my, my greatest responsibility when I stand and, and, and preach God's Word to you is not just to selectively teach God's Word, but to do the best of my ability to preach the full counsel of God. I tell you, Calvin, as you're going through the Bible, isn't that what your goal is? I mean, literally, you're trying to preach it all, brother. I, I have some in your class wondering if they're going to be here when you get to Revelation. But 
But guess what? You know, when he asked me to be able to teach that class, he says, can I just teach the Bible? You know what? I want to teach all of it. I want to be as true as I can to all of it. I like how someone put it when they said, what does it mean for you and I to, to help make disciples? He said, we help people believe in Jesus. We help people belong to Jesus. We help people through our teaching to become like Jesus. And I can tell you, that's what we're supposed to be about. And then the next question is, okay, when is Jesus telling us to go? Or where, rather, I'm getting ahead of myself. Where is Jesus telling us to go? And I can just tell you, I'd go back to what it says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Where he says, after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and let me just tell you, the greatest evidence that you have truly received the Holy Spirit of God is that you want to help other people come to know Jesus. He says, after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem. Now, what is Jerusalem? That's where you live. That's with those who are around you, those who are close to you. And then Judea. Those that you relate to, it may be at school, it may be at work, it may be in your neighborhood. Then Samaria, let me just tell you, for a Jew to be told to go to Samaria, that was to tell him to go to a place where he would not be at home. He would be out of his element. He would be less than comfortable. And sometimes being obedient to him means I'm willing to go to those that I may not normally, naturally associate with and share with. But what draws me is the fact that they need Jesus. And can I just tell you during this Christmas season, when, when the world gets caught up in all the commercialism of this season and this time, there's not anybody you and I are going to run into or meet that doesn't need Jesus. The greatest gift of all, God's gift of His Son. And then to all the world. Let me just tell you, we're to be a going people. Going to all the world, all of our world. Some of you may never make it to Tanzania. I don't know that I will ever make it to Tanzania like Mr. Pepper, like Mark Pepper. But you know what? I need to be found faithful going into my world where God has placed me. And then the question that I wrote down also as I thought about that is when are we supposed to do it? When are we supposed to do it? And the answer is now. That's not something that we just keep putting off to another day. That's for today. That's for now. <laughs> I, I remember hearing the story of a little boy whose neighbor was known for baking cookies and desserts. And guess what? The neighborhood kids loved her. And inevitably, when they would smell the aroma, guess what? They would come running. And one day, she had just finished baking something, and she saw little Johnny running toward her house. And she could see him through the window, and she began to yell at him and said, Go around to the back. Go around to the back. My husband just painted the front step. Go around to the back. And he yells back and says, I'll be careful. I'll be there in a minute. And she yells at him again. Says, go around to the back. And he yelled back and says, I will be careful. You know, I'll be there in just a minute. That happened about three times. And then all of a sudden she yelled at him and said, stop. I don't want you to be careful. I want you to be obedient. Do you know what? I think sometimes when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ, we try to be far too careful. When God's call is that you and I would be obedient. And let me tell you, if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior, you're responsible for sharing Jesus with those about you. As you are going. 
I, I, I know that I have been blessed as your pastor to travel the world around and get to preach the gospel. And I've been blessed to, to have others from our church be able to go on mission trips. Let me just tell you, you can't put that off and say, well, one of these days I'm going to get to go on that mission trip. Or one of these days I'm going to find my opportunity. Let me tell you, anything other than obedience is disobedience when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our calling is right now. We're called to go. And then I love this. How? How? How is Jesus encouraging us to do it? As I read back through this passage, <laughs> as we go, there are two things that stand out. The first of those, we go under his authority. He's the one who is authorizing us to go. And notice what it says about his authority. It says in verse 18, And Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. When he said all authority, guess what all authority means? All authority. There was no one greater. There was no one above. There was no one beyond. He says all authority has been given unto me. And when he's talking about the heavens, he's not just talking about the stars and the moon. He's talking about over all spiritual forces in the heavens. Gabriel and the angels, Satan and his demons, all authority is his. All authority, heaven and on earth. He is sovereign. And guess what? It's out of his sovereignty. It's out of his authority. He authorizes you and I to go. I like how the Apostle Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He has given to each and every one of us the ministry of reconciliation. I, I like how different ones have put it. You know what? I may be the preacher of the church, but I'm looking at the ministers. Because I, I can just tell you, if you're here and you know Jesus, he has given to you the ministry of reconciliation. And as you and I go, we go in his authority. Now, let me just kind of, as I've thought about this, how, how do I explain that he's given us that authority? And here's what I came up with. It came from the other day when I was driving up Reynolds Road at 6 o'clock. Any of you driven up Reynolds Road at 6 o'clock? That's not something I enjoy doing. Because I can just tell you, it takes forever. And if you're like me the whole time I'm driving and it's starting to stop traffic and I'm thinking, is there an accident? Why is this taking so long? It's a straight shot, folks. Somebody just needs to learn how to drive. Now, do you know what? Being a problem solver like I am, I could get out and I could direct traffic. And I could get folks moving up Reynolds Road a whole lot quicker than they presently do. Wouldn't that be great? If you've ever driven it, some of you is like, Brother Mike, I wish you would do that. Would you show up at about 5.30 to 6.30 and just keep everything flowing? You know what? I could do that except for one thing. Nobody has given me the authority to do it. In fact, they would haul me off. If I tried to, isn't that right? But let me just tell you, when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ, he has given you the authority. He's given me the, he has authorized you to, to be a minister of reconciliation, telling the world in which you live how they can be known, how they can be made right with God through Jesus Christ. 
We have that. He is, he is the one that has the authority, and he's the one that's authorizing us to go. And then one other thing he gives us, not just his authority, but I love it. He gives us his authority. He also gives us the assurance of his presence. Notice how he ends this. He says, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. And then he says, behold, I am with you most of the time, right? I am with you always, all the time. As Hebrews 13, 5 and 6 puts it, he says, I will never, ever leave you. I will never forsake you. Can I just tell you, when you and I are willing to be obedient, when we're willing to go in his authority, we have the assurance of his presence. I can just tell you, one of the reasons sometimes we don't experience that presence and that power is because we're not following as we should. Because as we follow him, as we share him, he will empower us. And he will manifest his presence through us. And then we get to that last question. Some of you saw six questions and you said, Preacher, you're never going to get through this. I just want you to know, when we get to that last question, it's simply this. Why is Jesus giving this this command? Why is he doing it? It's as simple as what it says in 2 Peter chapter 9. He's not willing that any perish. He's not willing that any perish, but that all come to repentance. Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 23 he says, I take no delight in the death of the wicked, but that they would turn from their wicked ways and that they would live. Or my favorite verse in the Bible, probably I've shared it with you on many occasions, John 10.10. 10. He says, the thief, the devil, comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. I can just tell you why. Why is Jesus giving us this command? Because he died. That through faith and trust in him, no one would come under condemnation. No one would be eternally separated from God. No one would be left out of his kingdom. No one would have to experience the reality of hell itself. And can I tell you, that's why he's given us this calling. It's not so that we can grow big churches. It's not that we can make a name for ourselves. It's that more people can come to know him. I shared with you a while back, now several years ago, I was asked to serve on a committee for our state convention, the nominating committee, at a time when there was a lot of issues going on within our state convention. And the president of our state convention called and said, Mike, I want to ask you to serve on this committee, but I have one question for you. He said, what is your agenda? I can just tell you, I don't get asked very often, what is my agenda? And I told him, my agenda is to see as many people in heaven as possible and as few people in hell as possible. And he said, I could live with that. Would you be willing to serve? Can I tell you, I believe that's Jesus' agenda. And maybe you're here. 
Maybe you're here and you have never trusted in Jesus Christ. And here I'm talking to believers, I'm talking to Christians about their need to take serious the Great Commission. But maybe today you're here and you've never trusted Jesus. Today I would invite you. I would invite you to confess Jesus Christ is your Lord and is your Savior. And then if you have done that, maybe today you need to come and publicly profess Him and follow Him baptism. Be a part of this church. Help us to make Him known. Maybe today. You know, the reason that you're not leading other people to follow Jesus is because you're not following Him as you should. Maybe today you need to renew your commitment to Christ. Or maybe today there's just some that God has laid on your heart you need to lift up before Him and pray God would help you in being the witness God wants you to be. Today, as God speaks to your heart, would you hear this word from our Lord? Not just as a word for disciples of old, but a word for you and I afresh and anew today. Would you stand with me as we pray? Heavenly Father, again, I come and I thank you for your word and how it speaks to our heart, how it challenges us. And Lord, I thank you that through our giving and through our praying, we help support over 3,600 missionaries that are serving in various places in our world. And God, certainly I pray you would help us to support them and encourage them. But Lord, as we would come to this time of invitation, Father, I pray we would be serious about being obedient to your call on our life. Father, there are some here you're calling to salvation. 